Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. I uh, hope you're enjoying lunch. We're about to start our panel on the future of talent. So uh, get settled and uh, welcome our distinguished panelists to the stage. Terrific. Hi, everyone. I'm Michael Horn, Chief Strategy Officer at the Entangled Group, joined by an illustrious panel. Uh, actually, I was reflecting on this. We're talking about the future of talent today, and I couldn't imagine a greater set of folks uh, to, to put on a panel and have a conversation as, as all of you, uh, writers, thinkers, leaders uh, uh, in policy and institutions, government, uh, on, on all these dimensions. And so I think we're going to have a terrific conversation. The hope is that uh, after the first question, I won't say anything more. Uh, <laughs> but to my immediate left, uh, we have Martha Cantor, of course, the uh, former Undersecretary of Education in the previous administration. Did I do that all right? Yes, thank you. Uh, <laughs> then we have Jamie uh, Marisotis from the Lumina Foundation, uh, the president of Harvey Mudd, uh, Maria Clave, uh, the president of Northeastern University, Joseph Ayun, and then, of course, the former governor of uh, Delaware, uh, Jack Markell. So join me in welcoming these folks to the stage. Thank you. And as we think about this uh, topic of the future of, of talent, the first question I want to start you all off with, uh, hopefully a provocative question, but, uh, and we can debate the merits of whether it even matters the answer uh, afterwards, but uh, just uh, President Ayun, in your book, which was today, the in Inside Higher Ed said, the one book you should read uh, this year, uh, so everyone get it. Um, you, you've said that close to 50% of jobs may disappear uh, or be substantially changed uh, in the future. And I'd love you all to reflect, because there's been other predictions that have come out and said, we actually don't think it's that stark, that it's more changes within jobs. And I, I'd, I'd love you all to reflect on how you see this future playing out over, over the next 10, 15 years. Go for it, Joseph. No. Uh, I, you want to start with me? Mm. Yes. OK. What's your book? We, we need a target. The, yeah, exactly. okay, you need the target. We can Jamie, attack you. Jimmy, I thought you were a friend. <laughs> <laughs> now, so, look, the point is, is very simple. With automation, AI, and robotics, many of the jobs are going to disappear and be completely transformed also. Various projections said up to 50% of the jobs would disappear in the advanced economies, in the emerging economies, up to 70%, according to the World Bank. But the percentage does not matter because you'll always have, you always have people saying it's not, you know, it's not going to be 40%, it's, going to be, it's not going to be 50, it's going to be 40. The point that we have to focus on is that everything that could be subject to a process will disappear because it will be taken over by automation. And therefore, the question for us what are the robot-proof jobs, and what is the mission of higher education and education in general, and how can we make people robot-proof? So rather than focusing on the percentage, focus on the fact that we are in the period where there is an, a, a new revolution, simplistically referred to as AI revolution. Jobs will disappear, new jobs will be created, and what are the opportunities for higher education? And those jobs that will be created will require the human competency. That's what we should focus on. So I think the mild little pushback I might do is... Coming from a STEM college. Come on. <laughs> from the best STEM college. Let's just be really clear about it. From the best STEM college. Thank you. Um, the thing I would say is that I think there's going to be a lot of hybrid kinds of responsibilities where people need the skills to work effectively with automation. And so when I think about what's most important for people to learn, it's going to be definitely some chunk of math and computer science. It's also going to be some chunk of other areas because I think domain knowledge and experience is still going to be an important. But it's also going to be whatever the communication, teamwork, collaboration skills that make you work well in partnership, whether it's with other human beings or with automation. You know what I realize, Maria? 
you didn't read the book. Mm. It's because true. You, because, I didn't read the book yet. Because you just said exactly the, the point that I'm uh, mentioning in the book, namely that what I, what I call is humanics. Humanics is the integration of three literacies. And I'm saying that every learner should integrate and master the three literacies. An understanding of uh, tech literacy, namely how computers work and how uh, you interact with them. Data literacy, namely understanding the sea of information and how to navigate that. And most importantly, integrating the human literacy, the ability to communicate, the ability to be creative, entrepreneurial, innovative, the ability to be empathetic with people, the ability to be culturally agile, the ability to uh, be global, to be ethical, etc. So that's the, uh, the talent we need, the talent that oh. will integrate. It's really three. depressing that we agree so much. Okay, somebody else, Jamie, you take I, it. I haven't, or Marta. Uh, well, I, ha I haven't read the book, but I've read summaries of the book, and as I just <laughs> said, I've, I've ordered the book, and I'll be reading it next week. But, He's but going I, on vacation. I'm going on vacation, taking the book with me. But I think what you also said, in, in addition to you know, those three literacies, it's also about making sure that our young people get experience in, in, the, in the workplace. And this is just so critical, and I think we've got to do a much better job of having the employers at the table with the K-12 system, yeah. with the higher eds. Right. And honestly, one of the best examples I've seen, and I've seen you know, lots of good examples, but probably the best was on a trip I took to Switzerland, which you know, many people know or believe has one of the best apprenticeship models in the, in, the, in the world. But this is not just at 30,000 feet, and this is not just rhetorical. I mean, and, and the power of what I saw there was a couple of 14 and 15 year olds who were spent half their time in school, half their time in the workforce, but then what they were able to demonstrate to us, by the way, they were, they spoke, you know, I don't speak uh, German, they, were, they, they spoke in English, they talked about the teamwork, how they had worked together to solve a real problem uh, in the workplace, and I think it really is, you know, they had to demonstrate the technical literacy, literacy they had to demonstrate the data literacy, but also how to work together as a team and then how to communicate that I just think we've got to do a much better job on all three points. Yeah. So look, uh, for the, let's start with the, with the assumption first. The revolution is being televised, right? We, we know that. So we know that technology is fundamentally changing the nature of work as we speak. We went through this time period where we talked a lot about high skill versus low skill jobs. We know that's all nonsense, right? Everything is higher skill compared to what it was before. There, that false dichotomy doesn't exist in, in our workforce. That means how we prepare people for jobs has to be fundamentally different than it was before. And this is the part that I don't think we've come to grips with. The problem is that our higher education system, our, our post-secondary learning system is largely a temporal system. First you learn, then you work. And the problem is it is no longer a temporal life, right? Working and learning are integrated and they're gonna be increasingly so because of that changing nature of work, because of how technology is changing how we, uh, how everything that we that we do in our lives. So that means that we need to think fundamentally differently about how we prepare people in work and for work, in, while recognizing the important values that our higher education institutions are still going to provide in that process. I'm fearful that our higher education sector has been slow to this. Your exceptions on this panel to understanding the, these issues. Uh, my concern is that higher education is still trying to figure out how it gets, himself, it gets itself into the pathway of preparing people for jobs, but they're still then pulling themselves back. Once, you know, their, their assumption is that once they're done, it's somebody else's job to take it forward. And that is not the way work is going to happen here in the 21st century. Yeah, I, so I can tell you some of the progressive communities have business, government, education, and philanthropy at the table together. I'll use Detroit as an example. We have the Detroit Promise. It's led by the Detroit Chamber of Commerce so that every student in, in elementary, middle, high school um, understands that the expectation for that broader community is high school is not enough. You're gonna have to earn and learn and work and do well in college beyond high school to get an entry level job to move up in that job and to live a successful life. And there are more than 200 of these communities now doing this, not in isolation. So higher education is at the table. Same thing here in San Diego. I can point to the San Diego Promise. 
Um, but what's interesting is, I think the challenge ahead is, how can we give students meaningful work? I remember having a lemonade stand when I was in elementary school. And it taught me what a work ethic is. And when I didn't have the lemonade out, I lost my little revenue stream and what da 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 um, but if kids don't have any kind of model or supervision, and we were just at High Tech High today, this morning, 70% of students first generation, low income communities, they run the whole set of schools on a lottery. Um, if those kids don't have the models, they won't have a lemonade stand, they won't have a savings account, 30% of people in America are unbanked. So where is the financial literacy to make good decisions as you're growing the pot? So my dream uh, is give middle school and high school students some work experience, do a pipeline from the two-year and the four-year schools. There are tons of models out there. This should not be something new. This has been tried and tested, but it's not yet implemented. Well, I'm going yeah, go um, go to put in a plug for Northeastern University. And... Um, so I think many people know that I'm Canadian and that in Canada, every university has co-op programs. So typically a student takes five years to do a four-year degree. They graduate with a bank account with a surplus in it instead of a student loan because they're earning while they're doing that. The only universities that I know that are highly respected in the US that really have real co-op programs are Northeastern Kettering University. And, you know, I've been saying for decades that this is something the U.S. really has to do because that's how students get exactly that mix of work experience. They get skills while they're actually at university. So do you want to brag about your co-op program? No, thank you. I mean, you, you did that, and I, I thank you. You're, you know, coming from the best school. STEM school ever, ever. ever. yes. So we love that. We're going to separate Look, folks. the two of you. <laughs> What we are talking about is something that higher education has done. Namely, we have created a separation and dichotomy between learning to live and learning to earn a living. This, as my colleague said, is obsolete. That's what you said. It's obsolete, and we, for instance, in my institution at Northeastern University, we, ha we have 3,000 employers in 136 countries. I'm, I'm, I'm bragging now. But the point is about the integration between the classroom experience and the world experience. And, you know, you raised an important point. You said this should not start in the universities. And they, we have a responsibility in higher education to bring the K through 12 to do that. So, for instance, last year, we started the workshop for for K through 12 educators in the United States and Canada. We don't want to, we included Canada, and this year we're doing that too, because those educators responsible for systems, like the Chicago system, Jamie, wanted to in include experiential education in uh, what uh, is being done, in, what, in the K through 12 uh, model. But the question becomes, why do we need uh, experiential education? And the answer is very simple. Jack already talked about it. It allows you to understand yourself, what you're good at, what you're not good at, to understand others and work with others, and to see the opportunities and the gaps. We, and therefore say, you know, many students come back and say, look, I see a gap, I see an opportunity, I can innovate, I can be an entrepreneurial person. But more importantly, let's go back to the beginning of what you said. You said that jobs are going to be transformed or disappear. And therefore, we have to do what we humans can do that machines cannot duplicate. And those are the, you know, what we discussed. We talked about humanics, et cetera. But let's go beyond that. Computers, AI systems, do not move from a context to another. They don't know how to do it. Whereas we do that constantly. And that's our strength, and that's the power of experiential education. This is something that humans can do that machines have not been able to duplicate. And that's the beauty of what uh, of the experiential do. You know, I, I do think that some of the best models 
now are not at the university level, they really are at the high school level, and, and reaching down into the middle schools. Uh, I know in our state, we scaled in the course of four years from 27 students to 9,000 who are participating in meaningful uh, study while still in high school at the community college or university level. They graduate high school with a high school diploma with college credits under their belt, but also with a real certificate or credential that proves that they can do the job. And this is increasingly important because I think when you, one of the things that is really um, frightening is the disconnect that we have between our employers and our universities. And if you ask the universities, are you doing a good job, and I'm sure both of your schools are, but are you doing a good job preparing students for the workforce? The college administrators say overwhelmingly we are. And if you ask the, business, the employers if the universities are doing a good job, overwhelmingly they say they're not. And so we have got to get past sort of the talking past each other, which is why I do think that the model that you have at the university level, getting kids into the workforce, makes it very real, very relevant. And one of the things that we've found most powerful at the high school level, it's a, this is a great program when you get these kids in the workforce while still in high school and studying at the community college or university level while in high school. Not only is it good for the students who do want to go on for further education, it's fantastic for the students who think about dropping out. And we've taken a hard look. Many of the students who, yes. uh, who drop out of high school don't drop out because they're not intelligent. They drop out because they think that what they're learning is not relevant to what they want to do with the rest of their lives. And there is no greater way, I think, to demonstrate relevance than for them to see how what they're learning can actually lead to something meaningful when they're done. So, so I want to talk about a worry that I have in, yeah. in, this, in this system. Um, I, I do think that this phenomenon of work and learning becoming integrated is real. It's going to happen. I don't think there's anything we could do to change it. I, I really agree with you about, about AI. One of the other problems with AI and one of the other problems with what I would call market-oriented solutions to learning, which I'm in favor of, to be clear, um, is that markets tend to be agnostic about very important things like equity. And I'm really worried about, and AI systems can tend to replicate the problems that we have with equity because they are learning from the existing system, which is inequitable. So one of the things, so my, my, uh, my, my, uh, my challenge to, to those of us who've, who've worked in the higher ed side is to figure out how we use what we have done, I think, well in higher education, which is to be engines of social progress, as this system of work and learning, integrated system of work and learning advances to make sure that those values are in that new system. Because I am not convinced that those values are going to be a part of an AI-driven, market-oriented system without, without us. And I'm not sure how to do that yet, but I'll tell you, I think HBCUs have been very important to our country for a very long time, and they're gonna to continue to be important. And I think the role that Pell Grants play in supporting low-income students has been very important, and they're gonna, it's going to continue to be important because they provide these leveling opportunities for populations that have been historically disadvantaged that we've got to focus on. But the train is moving very fast here, and we're seeing all kinds of, this conference is a good example of that, of innovations happening that are very exciting. But boy, let's make sure that we not lose sight of who needs to be educated in this work and learn system, and how important creating greater equity for those populations is going to be in that system. Can I add to your equity uh, concern? Because when I look at the AI movement, and I look at all the tech innovators that are here, and the entrepreneurs, and the academics, everyone who's here, and I ask the question, okay, I've probably seen maybe, you know, 100 new inventions in the three days I've been here. I want to see the analytics. I want to see who's getting ported from A to B to C and who's not making it. Because having spent my career and my academics are in testing theory, um, when you set that cut score in an analytic design, you're excluding people and you're including people. And I don't think the industry is transparent. I know it isn't. Because I ask that question every time I meet. I say, where's the evidence? Who did the evidence? Where's the, where's the modeling? Where's the formula? I'm very worried about false positives. So I'm very worried about students that don't have opportunity getting cut out just because we did it this way because the data was telling us this without that level of evidence. I want to really build on that. So um, I want to, first of all, I want to get a shout out to AI for All. 
which is an effort to really get AI to people of color, to women, to all kinds of people who aren't generally part of the community right now. That's an organization um, that was started by Fei-Fei Li at Stanford. She's also the Google Cloud AI architect or something like that, but uh, it's all across the country now. So I think, and really, Fei-Fei started it because she's worried that if we only have primarily men and privileged men who are designing all of the AI algorithms, we are gonna get bias. Right. We know that. So then the second thing I wanna say is I wanna talk about the problem that we have about access to computer science courses. So first of all, a shout out to code.org and Hattie Parto Partovi for really doing a phenomenal job in getting more high school computer science courses uh, computer science teachers and courses across the country, and also for convincing, uh, I think it's more than 20 states right now, to make computer science part of the requirements for graduation in their states. However, I want to point out a really serious problem that is facing every university and college in the country, including my own, and I'm pretty sure his too. You know, at Harvey Mudd, we allow students to pick their major um, any time before the end of their second year. And we have no caps on majors. And we think that's actually really important because we have a value system that says every student has to help every other student succeed and there's no competition for grades. So in a situation like this where the demand for bachelor's degrees in computer science is going bananas, and someone who graduates gets 120K per year plus a signing bonus plus a stock benefit. It's not really surprising that our number of CS majors has tripled in the last six years. And that's happening all across the country. Well, that would sort of be okay if the number, if our ability to hire CS faculty were also tripling. I'll just say as president of a tiny place, 850 students, we have doubled the size of the CS department over a 10 year period. That's not easy to do. But not only did the number of majors triple, the non-CS majors want much more access to computer science. And also the students at the other Claremont colleges want to major in computer science, most of them at Harvey Mudd. So it's just going absolutely crazy. Now, if someone were to give me, let's say, $100 million, not that I'm asking anywhere right now, I don't know, Illumina <laughs> Foundation, <Nice>. maybe. <laughs> it wouldn't solve, well, I have some ideas how it could solve many of my problems, but it wouldn't solve the underlying problem, which is increasingly both existing computer science faculty are being recruited to industry and being paid two or three times as much and are still being able to do research and are still being able to teach because somebody's got to teach in those companies right. when people need to learn this stuff. So for example, at Harvey Mudd, typically, let's say three years ago when we advertised a computer science position, we'd have 300 applicants. This year it was 5050. And we're not alone. So, you know, the, the real problem I want to figure out a way to solve is how are we going to meet the demand for people who can teach, whether we're teaching mature adults who lost their job or are in a job but need to transform their knowledge and skills, or whether we're teaching in the schools or whether we're teaching in higher ed. Because unless we figure out a way to solve this, the situation is going to get dramatically worse in the next five years. So how much does it cost to actually, because I'm saying this to the audience, there are many billionaires in this audience, um, how much does it cost for, for a professor? There's a few. Okay. I could do the whole college promise with 53 <laughs> of them. Um, how much does it cost for a computer science faculty member to be making a competitive salary with industry and to grow that salary over time in an endowment in Harvey Mudd or Northeastern? Let me, let me move away a little bit from that because I think it's very important but very topical too. You know, very limited to one aspect. I would like to go back to the notion of lifelong learning. And I would like to go back to the notion of inequality. We all agree, and Jamie, you mentioned that, you know, inequality 
is, the, is with us. But I believe, and this is one of the main reasons I started thinking about uh, the, you know, the AI revolution and its implication for society. If people are going to lose their jobs, you know, up to 50%, up to 40, it doesn't matter. You know, we are going to increase inequality. We're not going to reduce it. And therefore, the question is, what can be done? In, in order to be robot-proof, uh, we have to have a lifelong learning journey because we are going to be obsolete constantly. And higher education has looked at lifelong learning as a second-class operation at best. And this is dangerous. Why is it dangerous? Because you are seeing companies starting their own universities and saying, we are going to provide this lifelong learning. When we just surveyed with Gallup, Northeastern surveyed with Gallup, the, you know, the attitude of all the citizens vis-a-vis -vis AI, and they said, AI is going to transform us. We're going to lose jobs. And when they were asked, who do you is going to help you re-educate yourself, upskill yourself, reskill yourself, they said, companies. They didn't say universities. So universities are facing a situation that is not unlike the railway industry. When the railway industry saw the airline transportation revolution, they said, it's not for us. It is, and you know what happened. They missed the airline revolution. The same situation is happening in higher education. We say our job is to educate people for you know, 18 to 22 undergrads. Community colleges are doing a better job thinking along different lines. We do research, we do PhD, but we don't do lifelong learning. We look at it as a second class operation. And we, what is happening? We risk becoming obsolete. And for all you entrepreneurs, that's your opportunity to move into lifelong learning, but universities have to do it. Because if we don't do it, People are going to lose their jobs. Inequality is going to increase. And, but it is not enough to say we have to do it. Once we accept the idea that this is part of our mission, we have to relearn how to do it by having employers at the table, saying, sitting with us and saying, those are the needs of today and the future. Employers are not focusing only at, uh, uh, at today. They also want to know and shape the future with you. We have to look at building our curricula with, with them at the table. We have to look at rethinking the notion of degree. That's why you're hearing about micro-certificates, nano-certificates, stackable certificates. And you have to think about delivery. You cannot ask people to come to the, back to the university. The university has to go to you, wherever you are. It has to be on demand. It has to be customized. It has to be personalized. This is why I think that being robot-proof is a journey. And you, if universities are not going to be part of this journey, then we become obsolete. I mean, it's, it's not surprising to me that um, so many of these folks say that they need to, uh, that they don't necessarily look to the university, they may look to their employer. I mean, the data that Strata and Gallup have uncovered over the last couple of years has been shocking in terms of how dissatisfied so many people have been about their college education, and so many would have chosen uh, a different path. So I think from the, pr from the perspective of a university president, it's understandable to say that the, univer that the higher ed has to be at the table, but from the perspective of the, the people themselves who want to learn, they really don't care. I mean, they will go wherever they get the best possible education. And, and so for this reason, I think, you are saying, and the Wall Street Journal had an article about this, I think, last month, about universities separating into winners and losers. And this is going to be very difficult. I mean, it just seems to me that there will be dozens and dozens, if not hundreds, of four-year colleges over the next uh, 25 or 30 years who will go out of business because families are going to increasingly make the decision that we're not going to pay fifty or $60,000 a year for a mediocre four-year education that doesn't lead to anything. The winners will do just fine, but then I do believe that there are going to be lots and lots of other winners, represented probably by a lot of the people in this room, who will figure out how to give people the, the skills, the training, the upskilling uh, that they need. So I think it's, uh, it's got to be very difficult to be a university president these days 
uh, if, you, if you're not sort of figuring out how to make that. Uh, yeah, I, just, I just add to that point just quickly, because I think it's, it's a really important point that I, I, I want to make sure we don't miss. One of the challenges with the current system is that it's a provider-centric system. It's not a worker-learner-centric system. And that has got to change. I mean, when you say bring employers to the table, what I think you're really talking about, and, and you have written about this, is that we're in a new world. We're in a different ecosystem. And in that ecosystem, the monopoly of higher education is over. There is, there, that monopoly is over. There's now an ecosystem within which people can learn in lots of different ways and get credentials that actually match what they're learning along the way. Workplace-based learning, direct-to-consumer context, uh, in higher education, but they're all part of that ecosystem. The point of that system, though, has to be the worker-learner. It can't be, this is what we think as employers, or this is what we think as higher education. It's gotta be what's in the best interest of those people who are going to have to live that life of that ratcheted effect of work and learning happening all throughout their entire life. That's the fundamental change that's gotta happen. So, I'm gonna push back a little one on that one, too. And I didn't read your book either. That's okay. <laughs> hey, 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 hey. We, we see what your summer is going to be like. Uh, yeah. uh, you should see the stack of books. His book is on the stack, but yes. So Harry Mudd was created in 1955 to create a completely new type of undergraduate education in science, engineering, and mathematics. And one of its tenets was a lot of it has to be experiential, OK, which we were just saying. Another one was there has to be a ton of humanities, social sciences, and the arts. Another one was there has to be a ton of teamwork. There has to be an emphasis on communication skills, both written and oral presentations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the very early um, inventions was to have company-sponsored projects where students, not the faculty, but the students had to form the team and meet the needs of the company, and the company stayed involved for the full academic year, and we don't take any IP or anything like that because the whole idea was to have students learn about the experience of having a client and having technical objectives. Now, what we think our advantage for our students are, is, and probably everybody here knows that we're almost always number, rated number one or number two for return on investment, early career salaries, mid-career salaries. And we also hear from Google and Microsoft and Intel and Facebook and everybody else in the tech industry that Harvey Mudd are the graduates they most want to employ. And it's not because of their technical knowledge. It's because they can write, they can collaborate, they're creative, they're problem solvers, but most importantly, they can learn and do learn day in, day out. So, you know, I think one of the fundamental errors of how higher education has been conceptualized is we're gonna, you know, take the water hose and we're gonna, you know, feed you all of this material and you're gonna, like, get filled up and then you're gonna go out and spend it. <laughs> we just don't think of it that way. We think. We are growing lifelong learners. We're growing people who know how to learn from others, who know how to find information online, who know how to just pick up books and read them. And that's what's wrong. And when you graduate people like Harvey Mudd graduates, you don't have to worry about this because they are going to be learning forever. And we see them graduate in biology and go to P get PhD programs in neuroscience or in engineering. I mean, they flip areas all the time, so they're not just restricted to whatever they chose to major in. So I do agree that we have to facilitate lifelong learning. But I think the per first place to facilitate it is in our own undergraduates. It's, uh, it's a journey. It's not the first place, and it's not going to be the last place. It's yeah. a, lifelong, long, a lifelong journey. You guys are entrepreneurs, and you are entrepreneurs focusing on higher education. Why? Because you see gaps, and you say, we can do it better than higher education. You raison that you can only exist because of the gaps that you see that we're not providing. And this is what Jamie has been mentioning, namely, we are in higher education, we focused on, you know, the, we are the providers and you come to us. If we have to shift to the learners and be learner centric, we have to change our model from day one. You know, in, in one, the first aspect is the integration of the tech literacy with the human literacy. 
the experiential component, as you said, Jack, and to integrate lifelong learning. And we, ha we have to learn how to do it in higher education. And if we don't, we become obsolete. And this is why, Jack, you are seeing places closing. Because people are going to say, why should I pay $50,000 to do that? And this is your opportunity. This is why you are here today. Because you are launching companies, startups, based on our inefficiencies. And if you keep doing that and you succeed, you are making higher education obsolete. And the way I look at it, in the same way that you're competing with higher education, higher education has to compete with you and outcompete you, otherwise we become obsolete. Or partner. It's just, so, I, don't, I don't look at it as a competition, frankly, yeah. though. I mean, my call to action would be engage deeply, help higher education, and many of you don't need to help, and you'll learn more from higher education than you bring probably with some of you. But help that collaboration so that where people are learning, whether it's in your companies, in your startups, in your schools, in your classrooms, in K-12, in the park, that collaboration is going to enable innovation, confidence, and experimentation. Because there's not nearly enough experimentation. So you go off and you develop you know, your mindset. You bring in your team of engineers, and you come out with a product, and you sell it to you know, these folks up here. Um, and there's not enough two-way collaboration, and there's not enough sharing. So you might not take IP. Other schools do take IP. Whoever takes IP is up to whoever is innovating. Uh, I, but let's diverge because Michael wants us to diverge. Well, I have one okay. last. Yeah, it's yeah go innovation. Ahead. Go. Yeah. The, the, you know, higher education has to innovate itself. Namely, we have to launch. For instance, at our university, we launched companies. We launched for right. profits focusing on education. It's a two-way street. The right. collaboration is not. You are the innovators and work with us. We all innovate, and we compete and partner with each other. Both. Some of you do, and some of you don't. Yeah, precisely. That's right. the point. That's why it's dangerous. Right. That's why we're yeah. going There's to become there. obsolete. Sorry. So, Go no, ahead. no, no, no. This is great. I've, I've almost succeeded in asking just one question. For the <laughs> <laughs> so I'm now setting myself up for failure. But uh, this is exactly what I wanted to happen. But the, the question I want to end on you know, as, we, as we get near time is as we think about the United States context, what are our unique advantages and disadvantages as we walk into this future that you all have painted a very clear and I would say daunting uh, picture uh, of, of? And so, I, I, yeah. So I would say an advantage is the emphasis on innovation entrepreneurship. I think that's a real plus. I think a huge minus is that the United States is one of the worst, com worst countries in the world in terms of retraining people who lost their jobs. And we just have to look at manufacturing to see that. And so one of the reasons that the equity issue is so awful in this country is because our governments, whether state or federal, really do not facilitate retraining people who lose their employment. It's a lifelong learning aspect. The, let, let me, since each one of us is saying yeah, something, please, each, yeah. I think the beauty of what we have in the United States is the diversity of the system the education system. We have public universities, uh, public community colleges, we have private universities, private colleges, for-profits, not-for-profits, entrepreneurs. That's the beauty that of what, you know, and that what Jack said worries me because we are seeing this diversity being reduced. And we are seeing that states are defunding public higher education, starting with community colleges, I'm the president of a uh, private university. I worry about that. This should not exist. I, lifelong learning, as I said, we don't do it well. And I think, for instance, at Northeastern, we have you know, colleagues who are here today. They launched a program called Equip with, uh, the, that, uh, you know, with, with GE based on uh, impetus from uh, you, you uh, in, in higher education, the Secretary of Higher Education in the previous administration, where we embedded ourselves with GE in advanced nanomanufacturing to get, going back to your point. This we have to do more and more of. Otherwise, inequality is going to increase. Two quick, quick things. Greatest disadvantage, 
Um, this system is large, cumbersome, and despite its diversity, very difficult to move. It's the Titanic, and we gotta steer the Titanic pretty quickly here because the nature of work is changing so fast, that system's gotta do a better job. Best strength of the current system is that it cares about equity. That system, fundamentally, we value diversity in higher education, and that is something that I really think we've gotta to bring to this conversation about the future of work. That value system needs to be a part of, of these conversations. Can I just add, you know, lift the administrative burden, whatever government can do to help with that. There's tremendous weight. Uh, I know because in community colleges for many years, there were so many levels of barriers, and I think you all heard at this conference a great talk about Georgia State and how they actually took away or are taking away barriers to make students become those lifelong learners that we're going to need. But the other thing I just want to say is in terms of equity, Students are gonna have multiple jobs, so many more jobs than any of us on this panel. You know, we're the wrong age to be up here. Next year, maybe have millennials up here talking about it with us. Um, and because of that, students are gonna to have to have multiple skills. So I think the Harvey Mudd example or the Northeastern example gives students what we used to call the arts and sciences. Give them, you know, your three uh, buckets. Literacies. Yeah, literacies, your three literacies give students the practical problem-solving experiences, give them jobs while they're in school that are meaningful, not in the cafeteria. Give them jobs in companies, help them use their intellectual capital for startup ideas that you might not have th thought of. Anyway, I just think Perfect. that's the menu I'd like to see really moving forward. Governor, last uh, word. Uh, biggest uh, disadvantage, the forces of inertia are incredibly powerful. The status quo is really powerful. They resist uh, change. The biggest advantage we have, I think, this conference is really reflective. We have so many creative, smart people who are willing to buck the system and try something new, and we, need, we really need this energy to continue. Well, we have our charge. Thank you for giving it to us, and thank, thank me. Uh, join me in thanking this panel.